Right, I was I was told to be uh, have a very entertaining start to make sure that you know we're not in the afternoon tiredness, but I have to disappoint you. I cannot think of anything, but of, of two little I guess opening stories of observations so far. One is that this is the strangest conference I've ever been because you actually all know about crowdsourcing and even more than I do. Normally, I'm used to speak in front of CEOs and and you know big companies and I, I tell them about this and I, and I scare them and say you know you need to change the way you do it and otherwise you will die and uh, so this is normally very different to, to what I'm doing today so you actually are you know much more knowledgeable about it and I'm here to learn from you the, the other thing which is quite new for me is that normally I have to say oh hello my name is Simon I work for a company Innocentive which is a platform and we're doing crowdsourcing which is accessing you know, brains of all of you. And, and now that we actually hear all amongst kind of experts, I feel like you know, Centif is the, the IBM of crowdsourcing, so I always feel very dumb when I say what we, we do. And um, so I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, by the way, having worked for IBM before, there's also a lot of downsides of being the IBM of anything. But uh, as I was introduced, I'm a, I'm a problem solver, and that's what I want to do today. So I'm not going to talk to you about Innocentive, and the great products and solutions we have. But I want to talk about a problem because how I start companies and that's what I do in my life. And what I want to focus about today, I try always, here we go, is the, the pharma industry. And what, what that new model is that we, you know, we all together should build in order to make that, that broken system work again. And, and so what do I mean? Well, the problem about pharma and health in, in the drug industries is that they're actually serving masters. One master is how do we cure diseases and how do we make um, the world's illnesses go away? The, the other master of the drug companies, though, is profitability. And Serving the two of them, well, it, it worked in the past, but it got really, really hard over the last 10 years. So, for example, just to throw a few stats out uh, at you, which is of 10,000 substances that, uh, that make that kind of the initial testing in order to become a drug, only two actually in, 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 all, in average become a new medicine. It takes between 12 and 13 years for a drug, com drug company to develop the from the first substance to a new launch of a blockbuster drug. It costs about a billion dollars for them to develop and launch a new drug. And just last week, The Economist talked about the broken pharma model, and they said that over the last 50 years, one, it, it, it dropped 85, uh, 85 times the um, average of how many drugs you could develop with one billion dollars. So it's a very hard statistic to, to blur it out. But so basically, you could get 80 times more drugs done in the 1950s than with today's money. And they were recommending and saying, actually, if you want to be a thriving drug company today, you should stop creating new drugs. And it's true. So if you're looking at the, one of the you know, most best performing drug companies right now, Valiant, they're spending only 2% of the entire budget on R&D. That is much less than, for example, defense companies spending on new weaponry. So it's fundamentally not working anymore. We, we have misalignment of incentives. The risk is too hard for drug companies to develop drugs for cancer, diabetes, and so on. They go into lifestyle drugs that people can't pay hard cash and they, that way also go around the insurance companies. Well, okay, Simon, so you spent five minutes, you know, talking about why the system sucks and what we should do better. So what's your answer? Who's going to come in? Who's going to fix it? Should it be the, you know, open ministry and should we change the laws? Well, that's actually a great idea. Why not? Um, should we, you know, somehow change again the way patents work and, and do it from the bottom up? Yes, that's probably another great idea as well. My intrinsic answer to it is, you know, who, who am I thinking of who's going to step in and who's going to be the new pharma company of the future? Well, I think the answer is we. We all are. Why, why is that? Because we already are connected. We, we desperately want to get involved. 
and we are getting organized. As you can see, and this is not news to anybody in this room, obviously we are already connected to the sizes of countries and religions, and we form new groups around specific topics spontaneously, fast, immediately, as, as we speak. But the other important part, why this crowd revolution is happening right now, I believe, is because of online reputation. And I think that is something that makes a huge difference going forward, because we are now starting to trust people via the internet, through online reputations. I cannot believe a time, let's say five years ago, where I, I saw someone on, on the internet who had a you know, 70 star rating on, from 70 users, like a five star rating from 70 users, five of them my friends, to ask me to collaborate. Now that's happening, we're having, forming online trust with people in different parts of the world. That is important to actually form trust to collaborate on issues whether it's health or anything, to exchange goods and services. So this kind of online reputation is something that really is important, not just about connecting us, but connecting us in a meaningful way. And this kind of crowd revolution in health is not, you know, it already started. I'm not saying this is something I, you know, I think it's, it's going to be amazingly new, but I think it's going to come. We already have, you know, old school technologies. We have the walks for breast cancer. Well, that is a crowd. This is not actually a new concept whatsoever. This is, in the UK uh, alone, they raised 43 million pounds for breast cancer just last year, and I think 750,000 women and men were marching around the world for it. We have platforms already, patientslikeme.com, where 150,000 users are sharing information, sharing um, data about their diseases to help other patients with that information. And you have new startups, like CrowdMed, that is trying to crowd diagnose um, di diagnosis for, for patients. And then one other story, which is the one that we did in Incentive, that really opened my eyes, which is about this involvement piece that the crowd wants to get involved. We ran a competition last year when a guy from America came to us and said, hey Simon, I'm, I'm having a problem, can you help? My wife has developed these really bad seizures after the delivery of her third child. So very sudden, and, and she was fine before. And I went to all the doctors in the world and you know, gave them the data and said, please, can you help me? And in America especially, that's very expensive. So he lost a fortune helping his wife to get better. No one was able to help him. And so he said, can, can you guys help me? Because you have you know, 280,000 smart people on, our, on, on the incentive platform. Can you guys help me crowdsource? a solution at dialysis. He said, sure, um, we can give you a challenge for free, go for it, but, but you need to incentivize the crowd. We were talking about this earlier. And, and, he, and we said, sure, well, you know, how, do, how do you get that done? And he said, well, I have $500 left, can, can we use that? And he said, well, that's not normally what we put on our platform, but sure, let's, let's give it a try. And so he put his data up and said, this is the situation, this is what I, my wife has, and please help me. And the best idea, the winner gets $500. We got 1,500 solutions and ideas, much more than we actually get normally for industry problems, which showed me again and us that connecting to the world, and they want to be involved, they want to help. It's not about the money, it's about being involved and, and helping. And so what does that mean for the industry? And I think so, you know, I, I don't think I said anything new so far. You would have probably have heard this in different pieces from different people so far. But I think the one thing you need to keep in mind is that, you know, we are all in this industry. This is, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. But I'm telling you that, you know, while we're already changing, you know, governments with, with open ministry, and I think, and I know that the boardrooms of the big pharma companies are scared, but also open in discussing this phenomenon. And let me tell you an example, a little story. About a year ago, after my typical crowded speech, which you're not going to hear because you already know the concept, I had dinner with the CIO of a very large pharma company. And he told me that they just spent $100 million on a new diabetes drug. So they spent all this money into research and development and, and so on. And right now, they were at that stage where 
they just couldn't get it through the Food and Drug Administration in America. Because he didn't know the 2% of the patient population who would be allergic to this drug. And he desperately wanted to get hold of that data, but he couldn't. And so listening to this crowdsourcing concept and, and what, you know, the fact that we are connected, that we are getting organized and more want to be involved, he said, you know what, someone I just realized something, which scares me. There are 346 million people out there who have diabetes. 346 million people. They have the data that we so desperately need. They also have money, skills, things, info, knowledge. And they desperately want to change and, and involve, be involved and create a new drug and make their lives better. I, that big drug company, have a choice now. I either be a partner of this crowd in whatever way, whether that is one of the platforms we saw before, whether it's one of the ideas that you might come up with. So I either partner with the crowd in some way or form, I, I exchange and I, I make sure that they get access and, and we, we exchange ideas in, in, or even money, or I'll become obsolete because they will do it with or without me. And that for me was, really a, a, a changing point because I'm telling you right now at the rooms of all the big companies, whether it's pharma or anything, they're debating this in your guys' concept. And now is the time to you know, really impact that. But I don't want to leave you with this kind of negative way of you, know, you, you, you partner or, or, or you buy. Because the, the, the idea that I'm telling CEOs of big companies, there are a few rules how you can play with the crowd. And I think that's also very important for us providers in the room as well, because this is what the big companies are learning to do. Number one, if you want to play with the crowd, you have to give them single bites to eat. You don't say, I'm Siemens or IBM, and can you please build us a new server? Or you know, can you please build us an aircraft carrier? It doesn't work like this. You have to modulize and make it small enough in order to play with the crowd. The second one that came up in the presentation just five minutes ago is, I truly believe that a company who wants to do open innovation crowdsourcing needs to change that from the top down. It needs to be from the CEO. And I always say it in, in a perhaps funny, perhaps not so funny way that I always, always say to when I deal with a middle manager, I say, you only dance with the crowd if your CEO is dancing too. And that is fundamentally about culture change can only come when everybody is singing the same song. And only having a, a small department in a company saying, yeah, we're gonna try this crowdsourcing platform or crowdfunding, I'm telling you it's gonna fail, not because of your external great platforms that you might all have, but because the company isn't ready. So I think my, my advice here is twofolded. One is, if you're a vendor to a big company, Make sure that you address that cultural and that, that leadership involvement from the beginning. If you're a big company or a government entity, well, make sure that goes from the other side about leadership. It, it, it gets so much further if you get the top guys involved and really believing in it. And my last advice too is, is about the crowd doesn't care necessarily only about technology, but oftentimes we're talking about as if innovation means technology. Which is a huge mistake because we're always thinking about these guys in the white coats who are, you know, sitting there and then trying new formulas or working on um, on a new code. Although I guess hackers are not really normally white coats. And um, but that's not true. Innovation can come in every department, any form. I've seen so much. You know, we, we have done this 1,500 times. These kind of contests. We have seen them in the finance department, in the human resource department. In, obviously in, in technology as well, but there's so many different ways of where you can help a company or a government innovate. It's not just always about technology. And I think that's a very important advice in order to get the conversation going. That's it for me. I want to be very price and concise. My um, email address is here, and I'm happy to, you know, be, I'm around for questions. I don't think we have time now, but if there are any questions later, um, find me in the coffee room or email me. And um, obviously, I'm happy to talk to anybody about how do we crowd change this world. Thank you very much.
Hi, Simon. Um, you gave us an example of how um, the drug company was trying to get data about how many, what the percentage of people who were allergic to the diabetes drug. Um, do you think this kind of information could come from the crowd? Um, and if so, how could it be validated? Like, how would FDA, for instance, be able to validate the number if, if this company kind of crowdsourced that information? How would the FDA be able to validate that number? Sure, good question. So I, I don't work for the FDA and I don't know their, their requirements, but I think that's actually the beauty for a lot of you know, innovators and entrepreneurs in this room, which is there is a reason why this guy couldn't just get to the crowd directly. There's a reason, which is you, you want to make sure that, you know, could they have done this in the past without the internet? They could have just surveyed people, I guess. But there's a reason they're allowed to, which is they could bias the data, they could pressure people into giving them the data they want. So actually, big companies are not allowed to go directly. What it means, though, is they need an intermediary, like me, or you, or someone else, to do that service. And that probably also means validating the data and also meaning that you don't have a stake in it. So you probably make, have to make sure you're an independent provider that v validates it and helps. But I think the good news is that I'm telling you, I talked to one C-level guy in a big pharma industry. I'm telling you all of them are having the same problem and they, they cannot do it themselves, but there's room for all of us to go and say, hey, we might be able to help you. And validation is probably one of the value added that you can do.